by just, you know, taking what Brad uh, had in mind, you know, and he was just saying, well, you know, it's like 50s, 60s, it's, you know, the superhero thing. Uh, and yeah, the, the fact that, you know, they've all had to go underground and just, you know, you kind of had the basic idea figured out, but there was no script yet. So like we spent almost a year doing stuff. And then of course, I have, as we got going, we accrued more people and uh, you know from the from the uh, from Pixar and you know got the team going but at, as I said for the first year or so I mean we were just kind of like pumping out ideas really it, it was all pre-production you know pre-production then moving into let's say well what would you say maybe uh concept art blue sky stuff moving into pre-production and moving into production you know? and so, you know, so so I, I ended up not being with the show for the last year, but uh, I, was, I, I did a ton of work on that. Hey guys, it's your host Julian. This week I sit down with animator Scott Capel. During this chat we talk about All Dogs Go to Heaven, the legendary Don Blue Studios, a little who framed Roger Rabbit and Dick Williams, and we get into the weeds as we discuss the production as well as designing the world of The Incredibles. Scott also details what it was like working with Brad Bird and why Pixar movies always tend to pull at our heartstrings. This one was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy, and thanks for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's in My Head podcast. I'm your host, Julian, and today I'm joined by Mr. Scott Cable. Scott, how are you, sir? I am fine. Uh, happy to be here. Thank Man, you, Julian. I, no, and, no, if I actually have to say thank you to anybody. It's Tom Cito, man. Tom, thank you for making this recommendation because I've really been looking forward to this uh, this episode for quite some time, man. Uh, through the animation recommendation, uh, Tom went out and said, "You got to get Scott on." Here's his email. Check him out. So I appreciate well, that's, it. That's a compliment because I mean, Tom is Tom is so connected. He just knows everybody. Yeah. And I mean, like to you know, get rec- you get a recommendation from Tom. He's got very high praise. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, he's coming. He's coming back on again next week because uh, trying to cover you guys. And I always tell you guys whenever we finish, if you had fun, I'd love to have you back on type of thing. And I was like, because you can never go through somebody's entire career in an hour, two hours, three hours. There's so many people I've had on here where you could dedicate literally six straight weeks and probably still not scratch the surface of so many of you guys and gals career. Uh, so like I said, I always appreciate it when uh, I can have somebody on and they say, Hey, if you like talking to me, you're going to love talking to this person. So like I said, I've really been looking forward to this one. And one of the things that I absolutely love going back and looking at uh, when I looked at, when I looked you up, uh, all dogs go to heaven, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. So one, one thing that I absolutely love, not only, just about Don Blue Studios, but about this movie. So this is where the sad part is, where I told you I might tear up on you. So roughly a month ago, I had to put my oldest dog down. He was about 13 years old and uh, his name was Louie. And uh, he ended up having uh, prostate cancer or pancreatic cancer or something like that. He, he was he was definitely towards the end of his life already, right? So he was very, very old. He was a shelter dog. We, we, we rescued him. Uh, and we brought him home. And then uh, sadly, like I said, we had to put him down. Um, and I didn't think I was sad enough, Scott. So I decided to put on all dogs go to heaven. I get about halfway yeah. through it, right? I get about halfway through it. And then I had to turn it off because it was just like I said, I was just, fuck, I can't, I can't do this just right yet. Uh-huh. However, the reason I bring that story up is such a little kid. When I was a little kid and I saw this movie, not only did I think it was a Disney movie for the longest time, almost like everybody else my age, because Don Bluth bringing back that classical Disney animation, right? Not only did I think it was a Disney movie, you guys gave me hope as a little kid because back when I was a little kid, I had lost a dog too, that my dog was going to go to heaven, man, because I got to see Charlie go to heaven, right? So I, I really appreciate this movie. So I would love to know, we'll start here, and then we'll see where the conversation really takes us. I'd love to know how you kind of got involved with Don Bluth, and then when you started seeing uh, the movie, All Dogs Go to Heaven, kind of pop up in the uh, in the ether out there when they were trying to make this movie. Well, uh, I mean, that, that goes back to about, uh, let's see, 90s, 86, 87, and um, uh I was in Toronto at the time, uh, working kind of freelance in those days, and uh, doing a bunch. Of, I was, you know, I've always been more of a guy doing layout and design and storyboards. Okay, that's been kind of. I, I must I say, I never actually pursued the actual animation thing. Right, yeah. I had a couple of little jobs, but uh, so that's 
I was doing stuff just, you know, for some studios around town, mostly in the fan up anyway. And I had also taken up some teaching, I think it was, uh, uh, back in my old school, uh, Sheridan. I was doing a bit of part-time teaching. And anyway, Don came to town. Obviously, I'm, you know, but he had, uh, Don had already, of course, done Secret of Nim mm. and then, and, I, and also uh, American Tale at that yeah. point. And they were in production on the uh, Land for Time. And somewhere in there, they decided that they needed a better place to work. You know, obviously it's economics and they had decided to camp to Ireland. And they were setting up that studio in Ireland, and it was obviously with tax credits and all that kind of stuff. So he was recruiting, basically. And so what happened is that he showed up at Sheridan, uh, this Sheridan College, and, uh, you know, gave a talk, et cetera, you know, to the student body there. And um, there was, you know, there was a couple of guys there who I knew from before uh, who were working with him already. And uh, so, of course, you know, they kind of pull me aside and say, so, you know, there's, you know, there's a studio in Ireland, you know, it's, uh, you know, we could, we could really use people and, uh, you know, your name's coming up. So I went, so I went for it, basically. That's what happened. So, you know, myself and my uh, then girlfriend, you know, uh, that we uh, went over to, and yeah, went to the studio. So in terms of all dogs go to heaven, like that was like, they were still, they were halfway through um, Lent for time. Mm. And, uh, you know, obviously there was all kinds of, uh, you know, just, uh, teething problems, you know, just kind of getting a new studio up and running in a different country, all this kind of stuff, you know, so it was, they were kind of, they were managing, but, you know, they were, they were, uh, uh, you know, having a go of it. Anyway, and then All Dogs Go to Heaven had sort of, I'm going to say it was in production, it was like sort of in story and layout by the time I got there. So basically, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I was hired to go do layout, so I went over there, just kind of jumped right in and just started working. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, it was just, it was, and it was, uh, yeah, it was interesting from the start because you kind of went, oh, okay, yeah, dogs, you know, super, sort of a, this supernatural story, <laughs> dogs go to heaven. And then there's this rascal who kind of games the system and manages to come back and then, you know, kind of has his own agenda of his own and all that stuff. It was kind of, it, it was because it was reminiscent of, and they said this, that they were trying to do a film that was kind of like those old, uh, you know, the society comedies from the 30s in Hollywood. Uh, in fact, I think there might have been one or two stories that actually, the, 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 or movies that the story was based on, mm -hmm. which I can't remember right now, but there are. Do you remember like um, the one called, uh, uh, I think it's a guy, it's a football player. And he dies and he goes to heaven, but he, then he comes back because he has to do something. Um, was that, know, the one with, was that the one with Cuba Gooding Jr.? Sorry? Was that the one with Cuba Gooding Jr.? Any given, was it any given Sunday? I don't know. Like uh, he, That was the remake. Yeah, but there was, yeah, there, there was a remake. Actually, there was a remake with Warren Beatty, but <laughs> this is a movie that was done way back in the 30s. So anyhow, it's. Yeah, obviously there was like a lot of stuff going like that. And the other thing that they that they uh, capitalized on was that they had, uh, you know, Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise who were kind of hot at the time, you know. So they were the, the kind of a voice duo and they, you know, wrote a lot of stuff around that. So yeah, so it seemed like, you know, it was a, it was a good project. And then, um, and you know, they had, oh, they had also, uh, it was, uh, they'd been, they were being bankrolled kind of by this, they had this kind of sugar daddy. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you've heard about this, I mean, John will tell you, John Palmer will tell you way made more about this. Day. And his name was uh, Sullivan. And now I can't remember his first name, but he basically was the one that, you know, said, you know, Don, you do whatever you want. You know, I write the check, you know, here's a blank check, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, which of course, you know, allowed them to, um, you know, get, get the thing, well, get it financed obviously and get, get distribution and all that kind of thing which of course is all part of the you know part of the deal and this is all uh only just you know when you're in the beginnings of home entertainment mm -hmm. like i think like vhs had only started only come out in about like maybe 1980 or something yeah. like that 79 or 80 i believe so by this time yeah you had a, lot, a fair number of releases and so on but that was all something that, you know, you had to, 
you know, you're a fledgling studio, you're kind of like trying to like, yeah, you know, figure it out. Yeah. But, but um, in terms of like, you know, yeah, you were asking, uh, you know, what was my kind of emotional reaction to the story or, you know, that kind of thing. Well, it was kind of in place when I got there. And, uh, you know, the, the thing is, of course, the way production works, you always get the story boards uh, done and then you get them on reels. And then you have, you know, generally have uh, occasional screenings for the crew of the whole film, right? And so you'd see, you'd see stuff and, they, and you plug in the pencil tests as, as you go along or the rough animation, however the media is. And uh, yeah, you know, there were obviously some, there was some of that when I first got there. I mean, you know, we, <laughs> here's one of the things that happens. Like you, you start to work for a studio, you're on a show and um, you know, you, there, you tend to sort of like kind of talk amongst yourselves and then you sort of go, you know, well, now why don't they do this? You know, like, I think maybe this should happen to this character. And so like completely not realizing that they're way ahead of you, you know, I mean, like they're already making the movie and there's not really much you can do so but it provided it and and of course there was there's ireland right yeah. ireland which is like pub country right so <laughs> you know, so there'd be like just tons of conversations of course that would happen you know concerning work or whatever you know and it would always be with a couple of pints and so on which was actually i mean lovely i mean i always have enjoyed uh i love english irish celtic culture you know yeah. that's always been a big inspiration for me so so on top of yeah actually that was interesting because on top of this uh sort of a little bit of hollywood that was going on you know there with us there was you know ireland out there and there were things like well okay i'm very interested in uh, there's really no evidence of it behind me but i'm also very interested i mentioned or before you started recording that uh, i'm a big fan of uh, medieval history and mm -hmm. art and you know, anything, you know, architecture. And I, I have done a fair amount of calligraphy, you know, like, and done a lot of pieces that were like, uh, you know, reproductions of medieval, you know, yeah. and stuff like that. So of course, you know, what do you have in Dublin, but Trinity College and in Trinity is the, what they call the long room, which mm -hmm. is this big library and sitting there in a case is this thing called the Book of Kells, right? And um, it's this manuscript, which has this long storied history. They actually, I mean, it's huge. It's, it's, it's big. I mean, it's like this big and it's like, it was, I think two volumes, but it's like about that thick. And mm. so they have it like open and you can just go down there and look at it. And this thing is like a thousand years old, you know? And it's like one of the greatest art treasures of the Western world. And, um, and every, every month, I think about every month, they would like just kind of go like this, <laughs> you know, they would turn a leaf and then put the case back on and then you could, you could, you know, so I mean, I could on my lunch hour, go down and have a look at this thing if I wanted to or on Saturday morning. And that was just like wonderful, you know, not to mention, as I said, all the rest of the, you know, there was, it was, you know, all the, as I said, the pub culture, the music culture, you know, there's, you know, there was music to, uh, uh, you, you know, be, uh, concerts, uh, you know, performers, um, what else was there? I mean, you know, there's history, of course. I mean, I checked out a lot of, we'd go for runs in the weekend and go check out castles and whatnot, you know, go and check out the West Coast and all that kind of stuff. What did that uh, book smell like? Very rich, very rich culture. What's that? What did that book smell like? That thousand year old book whenever you would turn- Oh, you couldn't smell. It was, it was, there was this big glass taste over there. Oh, right? okay. So I mean, you could only get so close, and then you'd bump your nose, you know. But uh, yeah, it was pretty impressive because I mean, the thing is, it's as I said, if you tend to look it up. Actually, hang on. You, is this is this cool? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay. Book of Kells. All right. This is something I picked up when I was there, and it was there was this facsimile of the manuscript that was being made by this. Uh, See, that's the thing there the that's really there. pretty yeah see and if you look really closely i mean that's that's life size that's the that's how big the pages are and you get like all this filigree and decoration in there which is just insanely detailed yeah and, and <laughs> um there was this swiss book publisher that was making this really bang up uh, facsimile manuscript of it and 
I don't know where I found that out. I think I ended up, I think, believe it or not, I think it was on a jar of honey in the supermarket. You know, I pick up this jar of honey, it says, Book of Kells, you know, what? You know, and, and it turns out like through the honey company, you could actually, you know, buy this. And there's about three of them. There's about three, three uh, pieces of paper, uh, three, um, Sorry, I'm taking up time here. But I mean, this, oh, this is just a booklet that kind of talks about it. And it talks about their, their facsimile process, you see. Yeah. Anyway, so, you know, I just go, well, what, what were the chances, eh, of like discovering that? All because I went to work for Bluth in Ireland, you know? But, uh, and so as I said, there was a lot of other stuff like that that happened. And we made, you know, made lots of friends, people we still, you know, get together with. We ended up, uh, but anyway, so I was there for, so it was All Dogs Go to Heaven, and then that went uh, into like uh, the, the other movies that he made when he was over there, uh, which was, it was Rockadoodle, mm -hmm. and then there was um, Troll in Central Park, and then there was, I want to say, Thumbelina, and then there was The Pebble and the Penguin. I think I might be missing one there somewhere, but so he did all those while I was over there. And then things kind of fell apart a little bit. I mean, they um, they had made a deal with Goldcrest for the subsequent movies. And then they, anyway, it just, somehow the financing fell apart and they, the, the studio didn't last. So people kind of ended up kind of scattering the four winds. We actually had moved home before that. I mean, I'll say one of the things that happened, the, probably the most wonderful thing that happened to me when I was there is that I had my daughter there. I mean, oh, that's okay. really cool. And so that meant like sort of experiencing, you know, the, the Irish uh, uh, healthcare system, you know, right. and, and, you know, having a baby in Ireland, and, which was actually wonderful. I mean, like they, they say, uh, you know, oh, you're having a baby. Oh, that's the most wonderful thing in the world. You know, that's what the doctors will say when you go. It's like they just are so laid back about it. It was just insane. <laughs> anyway, yes. but uh, let's see. So anyway, we'll ask another question. So that was, yeah, that was all dogs. That was Bluth. Um, and, oh, interestingly enough, you see now that would have been the late eighties. And so that would have been concurrent to when uh, they were, you know, when, when Amblin started, uh, it was Amblin, right? That made uh, Roger Rabbit. Yes, yes. Spielberg, et cetera, because yeah, I see, because they did, they did that sequel to American Tale as well, and that was done out of London. I remember going over to visit the studio. Uh, 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 well, that was being done. That was the the Western one. You remember yeah. all that? Five of those West. Yeah. 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 And, and, uh, um, I think Dick Williams so was. Did Dick Williams do that one too? That this stuff was going on at the same time. I mean, that's something that I'm also fascinated with. It's just uh, I don't know what you call it. I mean, just sociology. I mean, just connecting the dots. You know, like in yeah. history. You know, like. Uh, you know, stuff uh, in say animation production that was going on concurrently. And I remember we had a couple of guys, in fact, Tom came over to visit uh, the studio and while he was, he would have been working on Roger Rabbit. So, I mean, I never got involved with it, but we knew it was going on. Um, you know, I remember, you know, you know, going to see Little Mermaid, you know, mm -hmm. in Dublin, you know, when it came out while we were working on Thumbelina, I think. And, you know, that was just soul crushing. <laughs> Because, you know, Mermaid was amazing. I mean, yes. it's, it is interesting. Like that film is, uh, I could like, you know, they talk about it being the thing that just, you know, launched the second golden age. Yeah. And you can see why, because there's something about that movie. It has it. There's something that you just, you really seem to understand what that character is going through. And, uh, you know, even though, you know, technically I would, would say it's like obviously not the, the best picture in the world but i mean that that's it was the last one they did using cells right i believe before so they went, before they went to the digital process and all that kind of thing yeah and i mean we were dealing with that at bluth there was like um yeah they were they had started a, a cg department or a, a, a computer animation department so there were certain elements in the later films well even, even all dogs has some fun stuff if you you can you can see it if you look for it there's a couple of uh, well, the car, I think, you know, the, the, the parts where you see cars moving, that car that like runs down Charlie yeah. at, you know, at the end of the pier, I thought that was genius, you know, like, how would, how would dog mobsters like, you know, like do a hit on somebody, you know, 
on one of their own. Yeah, they hit him with a car. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, that was a that was a computer model. But of course, in those days, you basically built the model and then you had to print it out on paper, mm -hmm. right? So you 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 did all the and then it would have to be kind of stripped up on pegs and then. Uh, probably gone through Xerox. I, I probably I, I can't quite remember, and uh, you know painted so it would be cell cell animation, right? But uh, and you know and you're going wow because man you know we to draw that car would have been really hard. So you know what do you do instead? <laughs> yeah, well that's that you know that's where and look where we are now. You know it's like computers have just uh, taken over. It's, so it's yeah, really interesting. It's part of my whole thing, it's been interesting to have been part of, you know, the whole uh, shift over from, you know, really, really traditional, like hand-drawn stuff to, you know, the use of computers and everything in between, right? Yeah. It's really wild to see where it's come, where it started, where it's at now, and where it could possibly go. Oh, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's the limits or what, what what's the word or what's the term here? Uh, limits are endless or and I don't I don't know. It'll come to me after we get off the call. That that phrase I'm really looking for, man. Uh, but like I said, all dogs go to heaven was really really fun, and I haven't okay. had too many. Because to you know you know that's the thing that happens. You work on something and then afterwards you kind of go, oh god, I didn't turn out. Well. <laughs> you know, I get people who say, oh yeah, that was the best, and and, and it touched them in a very. Uh, uh, profound way and that's what they're supposed to do you know yeah i will say that it, it definitely it, it at a young age it made me feel okay with losing a dog and then, uh, okay. like i said when i got older and i watched this like i said i watched it probably the same day we put them down but you know it it definitely hits a lot different from a young age to an early age but like i said it instilled in me in that young age that hey man even though he's not here he's probably or she uh you know he or she's probably going to be all right man we're all going to be all right so it helped bridge that that uncertainty of death and life at such a young age uh one like i said one thing i absolutely love and i didn't know too much about don blue studios uh until like the last couple of years when i started this podcast uh, i told the story a few times on the podcast so i'll, I'll make it a brief one uh, i ended up buying the illusions of life frank and ollie's book um, yeah oh yeah okay beautiful yeah, book, right when i wait because that came out in about like 1980 or thereabouts yeah, well, I got the revised. I got the revised edition. Yeah, the reprint that came out. Yeah. Yeah. What I didn't know was like when I posted it because uh, the free plug for Jerry Beck's uh, cartoon research, his Facebook group, man, phenomenal group. Man, anytime I want to go on there and learn something, I've got to post a question, post a picture. I see somebody talking about it. I've learned so many. I've learned so many things from not only from Jerry, and people that are on his yeah, site yeah. consistently. Uh, he's it's just for a long time. He's very and he's very scholarly. Uh, yeah. Oh man, he. I tell it, I tell it all the time. He has forgotten more than I'll ever be able to retain in my life when it comes to the history of animation. And he is like, I had him on the podcast, probably my first year I'm talking to him and I've never felt dumber because like, I'm, I'm asking him these questions. And like I said, I'm very, very, it's in my infancy stage of the podcast, infancy <laughs> stage of really trying to he learn. The answer every time. Right? Yes. That's what was so great. It was like, I was trying to, at, like at one point, like the, the conversation turned to, let's see if I can stump Jerry. Right. So I'm just asking him questions. And then every single time he knocked it out of the park. And then anytime I've, I've had a question, there's a couple people that I reach out to. Um, if it's, if it's general knowledge and you probably worked with them we talked to inspector gadget a little bit before we hit record uh you might have worked yeah, with but i haven't worked with him so. no, no not, not jerry beck but you might have met the guy i'm gonna i'm gonna mention oh, robert sorry, Al sorry, sorry. Yeah. robert alvarez do you know who that, who that is rob alvarez yes i know the name no I, I don't know him but i know the name okay. yeah so he did he did some freelancing stuff on on inspector gadget um yeah. so like he's a guy that i consistently go to because i had him on early uh, early on in, in the in the first year, I think it was of the uh, of the podcast, and he's touched like pretty much every single cartoon I ever watched as a kid. From anything that was in Cartoon Network, a lot of the Nickelodeon. I don't think too much Nickelodeon stuff. So it was a lot of the Cartoon Network stuff now and back in the '90s and stuff when Cartoon Network first started. A lot of Hanna Barbera stuff. 
um, but he worked on, on Inspector Gadget. And anytime I had a question, I would, I would ask him. And if he didn't know, and he's very rarely as he stumped, I'm generally going to Jerry and like, Jerry, hey, I can't figure this out. You know, do you have any insight on this? And he just never pointed me in the wrong direction. Like I said, I've never been able to stump Jerry. I'm still trying. Um, but yeah, so it, that, that website is really cool. But the only reason I bring that up is because when I bought the Illusions of Life, I didn't realize the, that the revised edition was apparently missing a lot of the Don Bluth stuff. From well, there's some, yeah, there's obviously some sensitive history there. I mean, well, yeah. because Don, you know, yeah, walk out. Yeah. he left the studio and basically raided the talent. You know, I mean, yeah. that's how they would determine, you know, when he left, it was, you know, obviously a, uh, over certain, you know, things that were going on at the studio. And yeah, you know, we took uh, John and uh, who else was there? I think like Linda Miller and uh, anyway, just, you know, several like really top talents. Yeah. Uh, you know, from Disney and then started up his own thing. Yeah, it definitely, I think, caused some waves. Yeah, it ruffled and, it. You know, Hollywood, it's like, boy, knives out. It's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, it's, it's, it's interesting because you've got this this one train of thought where Don thought they were, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking in very broad terms because I don't know the entire story and I've been waiting uh, to have John on. I don't know if we're going to go in depth about the Don. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. Talk to Tom, talk to, there's a couple of books that would outline yes. it, but you hear more from, you know, people who uh, were, and certainly John, I don't know. John's, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to say something that, I'm, I'm just saying things that maybe, you know, maybe, I was going to say, John's a very, uh, mature guy and he probably wouldn't like tell you everything just because you know, oh yeah 100 percent that kind of thing yeah sure but i've, I've heard but, i've uh, heard but there's, uh, yeah, there's definitely lots of the story oh there is and I've, I've heard uh i've heard a lot of the stories uh and that's why like i never know where the conversations are going to go um generally if it comes up it comes up i don't ever try to I, I direct the ship in a sense where like, if I feel like there's something else there, we stay on topic for a little bit. Uh -huh. it goes. That's why it's called the what's in my head podcast. Cause I don't know if we're going to go here, there. It, here, it's there. All of that. that was also a very long time ago. And I think it's a lot less sensitive now. Oh yeah. hundred percent. But he's also told that story quite a few times. Cause whenever, whenever I have a guest on, I try to go and watch any interview you guys might have that way. I don't ask the same comment or I don't ask the same questions. The conversation doesn't have, cause you can literally go and find Don Blue Studio. John Pomeroy talks about it on sure. YouTube and you yeah. can find eight different videos, eight different times. And it's, it's the same story every time, you know? So what I'm really looking forward to John is because he was, he was like Don's right-hand man and getting to see a studio come up and rival Disney for just a little while. I mean, you know, a lot of people will say, well, they didn't have a chance. Nobody's got a chance until you take a chance in my opinion. Right. Uh, you got to take a chance. At a certain time, you know. Actually, so, here's something. If you don't mind me just jumping in. Yeah, go uh, for it. A thing that should be noted concerning, you know, let's say, the, the Don Bluth Studios, mm -hmm. uh, uh, time, you know, uh, in its sort of whatever you want to call it, in this arc. I mean, people ask, you know, what about uh, like Secret of Nim? How come Secret of Nim like kind of just disappeared? It didn't seem to get a good release, and and you were asked also asking Tom about Rock and Rule, do you recall? And Rock and Rule, which I worked on, that's also something that was before. You know, I got out of school, worked on that for a bit. That was Nilvana's, yeah, you know, uh, project. And it was supposed to, it got a distribution deal through, I believe it was MGM UA, and it was supposed to come out in the summer of, I believe it was 82. Uh, the same summer that Secret and Nim came out. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, though, do you remember what else happened in Hollywood that year? Do you go back to January of the same year? And um, there was that great big financial fiasco of a film. Black Cauldron. No, no live action. Uh, it, it, would you happen to remember? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being, stu I'm being an idiot here by, you know, pinning you down. No, it was uh, it was Heaven's Gate. You remember how Heaven's Gate came out? Do I don't. I was the Michael Chimino film. Like Chimino had done Deer Hunter, won the Oscar, then ended up, you know, they wrote him a blank check, do anything you want, and he made this thing called Heaven's Gate, and it was a disaster. But he had like, it. He spent so much money, it practically bankrupted the studio, which was, I believe, Columbia. But 
anyway, it caused a whole kerfuffle. There was all this sort of musical chair stuff all over Hollywood, people all like, lost their jobs. And something happened with MGM UA where they lost a lot of their deals. And that was rock and roll. And I think it was secret and in too. I, I, I got to fact check this again. But, um, and so what I'm saying is just that people talk about all this stuff and yet you got to, if you kind of pull back see the big, you know, look at the big picture, you know, see what, what else was kind of going on at yeah. the same time that had some effect on these things. And uh, because, you know, animation, well, nothing exists on its own, right? You know, everything that's pretty, uh, you know, is always connected to something else. And definitely, you know, Hollywood, um, uh, you know, has its ups and downs and, you know, that can definitely affect something you're working on. Just go up, go ask Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Look what just happened there. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I think I missed that one, you know. <laughs> yeah, it really does, man. It's an interesting time for animation, especially over at Netflix, man. Uh, but transitioning, like I said, <clears throat> we're going to go all over the place. And uh, I feel like this is going to be like a two or three parter, Scott, man. So I, I okay. already want to. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I already want to. I already want to bring you back on for another part because, like I said, all of these, all of these movies, I, I've, I've got written down here. I mean, it's you've done some really, really cool stuff. When I boil it down to a very simple sentence, you've done some really, really cool, uh, cool stuff, Scott. So one that I for sure wanted to talk about, because right. yep. one I wanted to talk about for real, uh, for sure, uh, was The Incredibles, right? Sure. And you sent me some pictures over uh, a little while ago. We're going to take my, uh, my tech guy, Larry, is going to take those pictures and he'll, and he'll put them in the background because they're really, really beautiful. Um, so obviously this movie is directed by Brad Bird. Brad Bird also did yeah. Ratatouille. Ratatouille is my favorite Pixar movie. And I, I want to say Incredibles, the first one is probably top. It's, the, it's right behind Ratatouille, man. It's a phenomenal movie. Um, but uh, like I said, so you're coming from Don Blue Studios. Before we get to the Incredibles talk, though, I do like asking this because whenever somebody on that's had a huge influence on somebody, I did this with um, uh, shit, Aaron Blaze, you know, Disney yeah. animator. Uh, I, his, his guy, his mentor was Glenn Keane. So I always ask him like, what was something oh, yeah. Glenn Keane instilled in you? Or what was something that you took from Glenn Keane as part of, he taught it or he used it, his philosophy and you implemented it into your way of working. So I got to imagine you working with John and you working with Don that you probably picked up on some stuff that they would preach or they would have as a philosophy. Oh, so well, yeah. Let's, have for Don. You could say, you could say just stuff that got beat into you maybe but <laughs> <laughs> in some ways but yeah definitely you know you were inspired by them sure yeah so what's yeah, the biggest so thing just asking if there was somebody some some somewhere in there yeah something that i was taking inspiration from or not, not so much taking inspiration from but what do you think is the the most important thing what is what is something that you took from the don blue studios and then you still used when you left don blues and you went to other oh, studios yeah. oh that little zigzag elbow <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm kidding. Um, well, let's see. Yeah, that's a good question. And let me answer it this way. Okay, the first, <laughs> the first couple of weeks I was there, you know, you get assigned something to do. And like, you know, it was, it was the sequence where Charlie is talking to the girl through, and she's in the window of the house mm -hmm. and he's in the bushes. I've forgotten. And they're having that conversation. He's kind of doing the fake cough or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. So there was all these layouts which involved flowers and bushes, right? And I had drawn some. And then, so Don's looking at them. This is like, you know, after working for a week, there's a meeting, you know, and there's a layout review and he's going, um, I think you need to go and look at some real flowers and bushes. <laughs> you know? And he sort of turns to, you know, whoever was like, can we, we've got a camera, right? Like, don't go get the camera. And so somebody comes back and says 35 mil camera. And he says, okay, I want you to go outside and find some bushes and flowers and crawl onto those bushes and take some pictures and, you know, get some good reference and then, you know, and draw from that, right? And, 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 and I'm kind of going, uh, this, this is a test, right? I mean, I like, am I, am I supposed to really do this? I don't know. Because I mean, like, I'm holding the camera, Dawn leaves, everybody's looking at me and kind of going, yeah, okay, well, uh, I guess you're going to take pictures now. 
<laughs> well, I did. And so long story short, yeah, it paid off. I mean, I was, I was on board with that, like certainly already in, you know, my philosophy towards art and so on. And I certainly was not trying to like blow off those, uh, um, those layouts initially, but yeah, definitely. You know, the idea that, you know, you have to, I don't know how you sum all that up. I mean, you have to, you have to be serious about what you're doing. I mean, you know, you take something you know, like, you really have to knuckle down, dig deep, you know, uh, and uh, do things Perfection. that will then benefit the arc, you know, because you, if you put more into it, you get more. And, you know, he, he was, he was right. I mean, obviously I was, I was obviously drawing from, you know, some kind of library ahead in my head. Uh, I might have looked at some reference, I suppose. I certainly was looking at other artwork in the sequence for style of reference and so on. But anyway, so yeah, I mean, it paid off. And I would say ever since then, I've been quite conscious of the, the need for diligence, I suppose, you know? So yeah, there you go, there you go. And uh, the other thing that, well, the other thing that happened with that is that I was there. They actually ended up putting me, I ended up becoming the supervisor of the department, which was for better, for worse, you know, maybe, maybe not, it wasn't like a super, superb experience, but that again, I think was something where, you know, Don was kind of this person was like, okay, we'll give this to this guy and we'll see if he can handle it. You know, yeah. he'll, you know, just kind of drop him in the deep end and, you know, see if he sinks or swims. And I've got to say, I kind of respect that. I mean, you know, like at the time, it's not fun, but maybe a bit of that. And I don't know. I might, I'm, but anyway, I was going to, I was about to say, you might say the same thing about Brad Bird. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'll stop there. Ask me some more. Uh, no worries, man. Thank you for sharing that. Like I said, I always like, yeah. especially with somebody, like I said, with Aaron, he did it with Glenn. You know, I haven't had too many people on that have had direct contact or direct working for uh, Don Bluth. So like I said, whenever I get a chance to, to hear about those guys that really helped push, you know, that second wave of that golden, yeah. golden years, man, that, that well, I would definitely say like for better, for worse, you know, all the stuff that Don did, you know, like without Don Bluth having done what he would have done, mm -hmm. the next thing would not have happened. Right. Because it was definitely things like uh, American Tale, you know, which then jumped into well, Roger Rabbit, which then, you know, made, well, I'm gonna, I'm not quite sure how you maybe link that to Little Mermaid, but, you know, there was something that began to happen in the world, you know, that propelled animation a little bit. Yeah. And uh, yeah, then we got, we got that, all those great, great uh, features and stories and so on. Yeah. Really did, man. And I, I really, uh, Tom brought up the, uh, Tom brought up the time that you were talking about when uh, everything moved over to London with Dick Williams. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I never got to work for Dick Williams. I yeah. always was going to do that. And I never, I went over to visit the studio a couple of times because uh, I loved his product. I thought like if he was doing, that was the, that would have been great, you know, and it was, it's funny how just things work, but uh, yeah, I never actually made it there. Yeah, that would have been an interesting time to be a fly on the wall during during those days, the Roger Rabbit days, because that, in my yeah. opinion, I told Tom this, that is a perfect movie, in my opinion. I mean, I'm pretty sure if you take any of the people that worked on that movie, and they'll tell you 52 things that were wrong with it. I look at it, and I'm like, it's a perfect story. It's a perfect ending. The characters are all there. Everything is there. It's fun. It, like, it doesn't matter that it was made in the 80s, but it was referencing 30s characters and stuff. Mm -hmm. Everything about the movie was fun. I enjoyed it. And it was just, like I said, it's a perfect movie. It's interesting because, I mean, you think about the people who are making that movie were, yeah, had kind of grown up with a lot of that stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'm safe in saying that. You know, people of my age, you know, that would have been Tom, would have been Spielberg, would have been, you know, Bob Hoskins, I mean, they would all have known, you know, those cartoons yeah. very well. And, and then when the movie came out, I mean, I just kind of wonder how many of the audience actually had, you know, would kind of get a lot of the, you know, the, the background mm -hmm. context. I mean, I suppose they would, but anyway. Well, I had, uh, I had Gary K. Wolf on, and Gary K. Wolf was the guy that wrote Who Censored Roger Rabbit. 
Oh, yeah. Yes, right. right. Yeah. So he, he that, walked yeah. us. Yeah, he walked us through. I'll send you that episode uh, after we get off this. It was sure. a really fun episode for to to listen to and watch because he walks he walks us through. Because I saw the movie long before I knew there was a book. As a kid, I didn't really want to read anything that didn't have. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. So I love comic books. Right. So that's all I read as a kid. And for the most part, with the exception of a few animation books that I read every month, that's comics is my pretty much my only intake on as far as reading goes right now. You know, I just don't have as much time as I usually do or before I did when we had the 10 month old that we have now. So whenever you have a baby, ladies and gentlemen, it takes a lot of time to, to help grow and mold this baby. I mean, in the best possible way of taking lots of comic books. Yeah, yeah lots of comic books. So. <laughs> But, uh, you know, Gary walks us through the entire iteration of it being picked up originally, then dropped and then being picked up again. Steve was Steven Spielberg and it was kind of dropped again. Then Roy Disney revitalized it. And then how they went. From, I think he said it was they originally wanted Bill Murray and then Bill Murray went away as far as the Eddie Valiant character. And then it was Eddie Murphy for a little while. And then it wasn't Eddie Murphy. So he takes us through the entire production process from like start to finish and it was one of the coolest like i'm sitting there and i'm just like i know i'm supposed to talk right now but i don't know what to say i don't want to interrupt i don't want to ask i just want him to keep going and gary was like i said gary was just such a cool dude um so like i said that is a perfect movie but transitioning into another perfect movie man Brad Bird did the Fantastic Four better than the Fantastic Four has ever done the Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that's that's certainly true. Yeah. It really, it really is, man. When you talk a visionary like Brad Bird, for sure, is up there. And uh, the Incredibles. I remember when this one came out. I went to the movie theaters with my younger brother, younger sister. Uh, my mom took us to see this one, and I remember, like, I had put comics away for a little while. This is ah, shit. This is early two thousands. So I'm almost at the age where I'm getting ready to hit high school. I'm in middle school, maybe. So I had put comic books away. I was like, man, comic books are done. I'm not going to, I'll still watch cartoons and shit, but a comic books, that's for like kid shit, right? So I'm sitting there and I see this movie. And I'm like, oh shit, this is cool. This is something different. It made me want to go back and start reading comics again. So where are you? Do you remember where you're at when you get the phone call? Was it just somebody you oh, were- I can tell you this. This is a good story. I mean, so- Okay, I'll go back a little bit. I'll pick up again on Bluth. Okay, so there I was, Bluth, you know, Bluth ended. I went back to Canada, uh, you know, picked up and, you know, there was work, but there wasn't, you know, it was, uh, that was a funny time. I think it was kind of a, there actually, I think was a bit of a recession on, in both the States uh, and, and Canada at the time. So there was freelance anyway. And then, I don't know, I guess there were rumblings of, you know, Disney getting, um, you know, recruiting anyway so I sent stuff off to Disney and long story short I got hired but really the reason I got hired was because this is interesting because we talk about you know the decisions you make the roads you take yeah and where they will lead you okay and like Disney was definitely it was very cool but it's not like I well I did make the effort to get there but because I had worked at Bluth and I had met people like, you know, because there are a number of the American, a uh, number of the staff there were, you know, his, his Americans, right, American people who ended up all going back to um, the states of California. And then, you know, as things shook out, you know, some of them landed in different places. And a couple of guys that, you know, well, more than a couple of them, it ended up at, uh, at Disney, you know, and this is like, oh, Dorsen Vera Lanfer and, and John Palmer and, uh, you know, all the, you know, a lot of the leading lights. Anyway, the guy, the guy who I had sort of like, you know, sort of connected with, maybe the most over there, uh, he ended up getting the gig to be the art director on Hunchback. And so he, you know, he knew that I was into medieval stuff and he'd seen yeah. me, you know, drawing, you know, cathedrals all day long, you know, uh, when we were kicking around in Ireland. So he just... You know, I'm basically on the phone, Scott, get down here, you know, and, and he, he put it in play. And that's how I, I kind of really got into Disney. So there you go. You know, so one thing leads to another, even though it doesn't really maybe. Uh... So anyway, Disney, Hunchback, you know, and then there's Tony Ficelli sitting there, you know, like who you do know um, that Tony is like kind of, uh, he was like the, one of the lead character designers at Disney at the time. Um, animated. I want to say Mufasa. Have I got the name right? I think who's so. The dad? Who's the dad lion in Lion yeah. King? Yeah. yeah. 
So, you know, Tony was one of the really heavy hitters. And um, so anyway, working at Disney for a few years, Tony had actually left after a bit. He teamed up with Brad, went over to Brad, Warner Brothers, and they did Lion Giant, right? Yeah. yeah. Like Tony was like, you know, again, one of the lead, uh, the leads on that. Well, I don't know why, but he remembered me and he recommended me to Brad. And, and so they called me to actually go work in Iron Giant. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't happen for one reason or another. I mean, <clears throat> just kind of like, you know, the work permit that I was on, I think wasn't going to let, let it happen. But anyway, um, that was a great contact. Anyway, Iron Giant comes out, you know, does its thing, you know, which I don't think, by the way, I don't think Iron Giant has anything to be ashamed about, you know, I mean, or any of the guys, like everybody seems to be worried that it didn't make any money. It's I'm a perfect going, movie. What? You know, like in the long history of the world, that's never going to matter. Yeah. You know, it was just a fantastic movie and that's, that's the best thing it could ever be. Anyway, so anyway, they, they call me again. They say, okay, well, we're getting ready. We're prepping this, this next feature, which, uh, uh, we'd like you, to, you know, to, we'd like to get you to come and come on board and and, and help design. And Do you like, know what okay. year this is? What's that? You know what year this is that they're reaching no, back out to? Be, this would be like maybe 2000, 99. Okay. Yeah, because like when did when did Iron Giant actually get released? It was like 99, I believe. 99, 98, I believe. Yeah. And so when they were anyway, sure enough. So I there's a meeting with Brad. I meet with him. He's got these, uh, you know. Uh, concept pieces that have been done by Lou Romano and you know and it just looks damn cool and he gives me the pitch and uh, it's damn cool and at that point it's still supposed to be a 2D film I mean but they're going to shop it around because you know obviously Warner's has fallen apart right because like Warner's has shut down the, the animation they were doing so they can't do it there so anyway and then lo and behold you know pick, it Pixar picks it up like it's a, Surprise, surprise, because, you know, Brad knows John Lasseter from way back, you know, at, at uh, CalArts and all this kind of Went stuff. to Disney anyway, together. So it turns out, so basically, the, so the film will now be made at Pixar. So anybody who's involved with it needs to, has to move from LA to the Bay Area. Yeah. So that's what happened to me. So anyway, and then, yeah, so I was about, I would say, I was probably about maybe the fifth guy on the show. Like there was like, there was Lou and there was this guy called Teddy. Uh, Teddy Newton and 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 uh, 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 Tony and mm -hmm. Brad and me, I guess. And there was, there, I think there was like you know a couple of production people as, assigned to us already. So yeah, and that was kind of like as I recall, it was the beginning of two thousand, uh, maybe November. I can't remember November ninety nine. I I'd have to look check it out. But so yeah, and that was glorious. I mean, so I was on the show for about three three and a half years i guess uh up there at pixar and so, and essentially it started by just you know taking what brad uh had in mind mm -hmm. you know and he was just saying well you know it's like 50s 60s it's you know the superhero thing uh and yeah the, the fact that you know they've all had to go underground and this you know he kind of had the basic idea figured out but there was no script yet so like we spent almost a year doing stuff. And then of course, I have, as we got going, we accrued more people and, uh, you know, from the, from the, uh, from Pixar and, you know, got a team going. And, but at, as I said, for the first year or so, I mean, we were just kind of like pumping out ideas, really. It, it was all pre-production, you know, pre-production, then moving into, let's say, well, what would you say, maybe uh concept art blue sky stuff moving into pre-production and moving into production yeah and so you know i was there for most of it yeah so I, I ended up not being with the show for about the last year but uh i was i i did a ton of work on that <laughs> so what was some of your favorite things that you got to do on the incredibles and what I, was, <laughs> let's was see. that um yeah it was probably things like e's house you know the yeah. whole e thing i mean that was that was pretty genius, you know, on Brad's part to have that character in there and, you know, the, how she relates to them and their, and that world and their lives. Um, and so, yeah, there was a lot of design of the, you know, the, the house, the exterior, and then the, the interior, the lab, all that kind of stuff. Um, She's such a fun character. Just, just the house itself, the Pars house, you know, there was a lot of work that went into that. There was the island, of course, you know, which was, uh, 
you know, that was, that was, I'm going to say a little more informed by, you know, all those Connery Bond films, really. Oh, actually, I should just say that that's actually, which reminds me that, because uh, I haven't thought about some of the stuff for a while. Ken Adam. Ken Adam was the designer, the, the, the production designer for, I believe, almost all of the Bond films and a whole bunch of other stuff, right? Uh, and Brad said, yeah, I want Ken Adam, you know? So of course we just go out and we find everything we can possibly find about Ken Adam. I mean, there was a couple of books <clears> on him. Um, I think he had passed away at that point. Did you know that guy, of course, I mean, he was English, right? Mm -hmm. So there he is, he's an artist, right? But the guy, the guy flew like fighters for the British in World War II. Yeah. Like those things that at the end of the war, that the, 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 the Hawker Tempests that had like, you know, the great big tank buster cans yeah. on them. Anyway, and there's, there's stuff of him talking about that up there. But um, anyway, so yeah, I mean, like you, you've, you've, you've probably, I mean, you know, if you look at the art book, if you look at the extras on the DVD releases and if you hear other people talk, I mean, we did a ton of research and, that, and that's, you know, I remember, it's funny, I thought we were doing okay in terms of like, because here's the way it works. Like you just amass tons of books there's a ton of photocopying that goes on. You pin stuff on boards yeah. and then you just have tons of meetings, you know, where you're, you're in a room and you're saying this, 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 you know, and Brad goes, no, that, that, you know, okay, fine. So you, know, you, you, wean, you wean it. So you're narrowing it all down. Right. And uh, at one point he said, he said, you know, I don't know. I feel like I should be getting a smorgasbord, but I'm just getting like chips and dip here. What's the deal? <laughs> I said, what? what? You know, so, uh, you know, that was, you kind of redouble your efforts, you know, you do things, I swear. I, I'll tell you, well, one of the best things that suddenly occurred to me, that uh, a thing we could use for reference on that show, because we had, well, the problem was that it started off as sort of the idea of a retro future. Mm -hmm. And so we were just trying to redesign everything, you know, the cars, the houses that, you know, it was going to be like, but then Brad didn't want Jetsons. Okay, fine. But he wanted this, you know, sort of, you know, 50s, 60s, you know, the, the future we never got, right? And that kind of went away after a while, because we did a lot of like flying cars and stuff at the beginning. And then it kind of settled down into, okay, it's really the kind of the, it's the 60s with a, with a twist. And then you got this, this the, the superhero thing going on in there at the same time. So, I mean, originally, you know, you're looking like, again, Ease House. I was looking at Frank Lloyd Wright. I was looking at, uh, uh, Oh, no, I can't even remember the names of all the other architects, uh, you know, that do those glass houses, you know, yeah. all that mid mid century modern architecture and uh, you name it. We had we had it all covered, but. Um, eventually, you know, we, uh, we, 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 we uh, you know, you get into the business of. Um, uh, <clears throat> production or pre production, then, you know, you're trying to like, you know, get it from the from the art to say a CG model, you know, and you know, all that, which, well, I'm not gonna say it was difficult, but I mean, I'll say that like there was Lou and myself and we really hadn't, you know, had that much experience with the CG production before. So, you know, there was a little bit of that, you know, kind of trying to get the, gain the confidence of the people who were there already, right? But already, and what else? I mean, when we walked in, they were just in the middle of Nemo. <laughs> Which was like, just like 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 drawing all the resources of the uni you know of the Pixar's like little universe there, right? Uh, they were just trying to figure out how to get the the whale's mouth to look right, you know. I mean, which they did. They definitely did. You know, I was like, and of course, you know, Pixar was just an, to go to Pixar in, in those days was just like uh, that was it. That was the place to be, right? You think and about that for just a second. There, there was a ton of things. Yeah. Think about that for just a second, right? They're doing Nemo, right? 60 years prior, maybe 65 years prior, they're doing Pinocchio, right? <laughs> Pinocchio, where, ladies and gentlemen, we talked about it when I had Sandra Cluzo on a couple weeks oh, ago. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we talked, we talked about it and we talked about, like, I always ask, like, if you could go back in time. And you can animate on one of the original Disney movies, like from uh, what was it, Snow White all the way up until 
my favorite one, which was the Jungle Book right before Walt died. If you could work on one of those two, what would it do? Uh, which one would you pick? And a lot of people would pick, like Aaron picked Bambi, Sandro picked Pinocchio. And I was like, well, why Pinocchio? And he was like the water. He was like everything was hand painted, right? So they had to figure out how water would look on cells and how they would do that. And then you flash forward 60 years and they're doing an underwater movie with Nemo. Mm -hmm. And there's, it, it's the only reason I, I draw that correlation is because 60 years ago, they're, they're creating an underwater, like what it would, what it would feel like, what it would be like to be underwater, right? Through traditional animation and then yeah. six years yeah. later they're doing yeah. it again they're redoing it. yeah yeah they're redoing it again with nemo and they're trying to figure it out but this time they're not using their fingers and they're not putting it on cells they're putting it on computers and trying to figure it out it's just crazy to see whenever you think of animation whenever you think of innovation walt disney's kind of really at the center of animation and, and, and innovation right imagineering yeah. all this other it's just crazy yeah. where it's going where it's coming from very, very impressive. It was a very impressive uh, run for, for those guys. I was yeah. going to say things like, uh, and that, and and e and in each of those, like you have a situation where you're actually you're not trying to create reality, mm -hmm. you're creating something else. You're, you're listening emotion. I mean, I, as they as they really point out in the uh, the uh, Ollie and Frank book. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, well, how did they put it? It's, it's, you don't animate what the character's doing. You animate what the character's thinking. Of it's like a naturalism, but mm -hmm. it's not reality, you know? And that's, that's interesting because, uh, I mean, that, you know, you can see like a duck, you know, there's all this CG stuff that's been used in like, you know, History Channel stuff, the National Geographic stuff. And, you know, it's all, and a lot of effects, you know, uh, and it's photographic, right? Yes. But, they're doing something different, you know, they're rounding things off and they're kind of, you know, playing with proportions. And, uh, and, and, and I remember Ralph Eggleston talking about the business of the, uh, the surge and, and swell of mm -hmm. the ocean that they were having to try and you yeah. know, get into the, uh, well, into the water, you know, that was ca the characters were situated in. Yeah. I mean, they had all so many things to think about. Oh no, it, it I mean, yeah, and they did it. And look, you know, Pixar was, was riding very high, um, yeah. which reminds me, maybe, I mean, I'll, I'm going to jump, I'm going to anticipate a question. And, okay. You know, I, a lot of people ask me, like, well, so what was Brad like to work with or work for or whatever? <clears throat> and I have a little story, which, in, it, it, which, which I think is a clue to the guy and which, uh, also is a bit of a clue to Pixar, I suppose. Anyway, what happened was it was like, you know, we're kind of into the middle of things. Uh, it's still development. And uh, they had a situation where they were trying to come up with, you know, like they were just beginning to do like the, the so-called subsurface scattering, mm -hmm. which is, I guess, like, that's just basically a plug-in now, you know, yeah. but I mean, then it was like, nobody had done it yet. And they were like trying to decide whether to do it on, I think it was Nemo. And we, we you know, ended up doing it, but it was a pain. It was, it was, there were problems because they were using proprietary software and they weren't using Maya yet and all this kind of thing. And uh, anyway, there was a meeting. It had to do with Violet's hair, you know, like how are we gonna do the hair on this girl? And, uh, you know, we were in the room. I remember we were standing. That, that wasn't a table that day for some reason in that room, but, uh, you know, and I wasn't really, talking I mean I was just kind of present in the meeting but it was you know Brett, and then you know some of the the, the the TD guys right the TD bosses and they were kind of going around and you know basically they were saying this is going to be really tough this is going to be like we haven't done this before we don't know how we're going to do it and Brad's saying but you're Pixar come on <laughs> you're the guys who are changing the face of animation figure you know? this shit out <laughs> yeah and this and they and, and they were going well you know and then Brett he just he got he just got quiet he he turned he, he like he walked over towards the doors and then he turns and he faces us and he goes then what the fuck is the point you know and the room just went Ugh, like this you know and it was and you know there was a big pause and a big sound and you know the conversation picked up but honestly i mean to me that that was the moment when i thought yeah i'm working for the right guy here you know, this guy is different than all the rest, you know, and uh, this, this, he, I mean, you know, they talk about how, 
Brad just kind of took Pixar by the scruff of the neck and just, you know, made them go places they hadn't gone before. And at first they were, you know, maybe a little bit, you know, there was, there was tension, but I mean, everybody got very quickly got on board. I mean, like everybody has loved the movie, like the first, the first, you know, the time we had reels up yeah. for the first time, everybody loved it. But honestly, that moment, like when Brad's, what the, then what are we here for? You know, yeah. what are we here for? If not to, you know, push the like do something new do something that people have never seen before uh you know make a you know do something where you're going to believe that this girl has issues yeah you know that's what it was all about right was you know the character the story you know shit like that anyway yeah you're supposed to feel for these characters man quite a moment i tell you yeah yeah, I, I, can, I can only imagine. <clears throat> and like I said just a little bit ago, man, I'm definitely going to have to have you on. If you had fun, man, I'd, I'd really like to have you on for a second part. We've yeah, where are we? Are we, uh, we, I, we? What's I, that? I was going to say, like, are you just like, you're keeping it just to a certain time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so because we're going to rotate into some fans questions and some questions because uh, we got some people that wrote in every time I have somebody on. I oh, always yeah, sure. OK. I'll, every time I always have somebody on, I always put it out there, say, hey, I got such and such coming on. If you guys could ask a question, what would you ask? And this is one I actually forgot to ask you, because this one I've noticed has slipped, slipped people up. So I usually give this one away ahead of time um, okay. because it's one of my questions, not so much a fans question that have written in, but it's one of ones ones I've come up with. Um, so I apologize for putting you on the spot for this one, but uh, Mount Rushmore of animators, right? And illustrators are somebody that you have gotten inspiration from. So they don't have to be like, I've had, I've had people use Eddie Van Halen as an inspiration. Oh. I've had people use Charles Schultz, right? So this is your oh, Mount Rushmore of, of inspiration. So you have four care, you have four people plus one honorable mention. Who would be oh, on your Mount Rushmore and who would be your honorable mention? I like go away and I can, I can type out and then send to you later. No, it's just got to oh. be on the spot right now. Well, we can do it on the spot, but however, there is another question that I always like to ask. So okay. if you want, we can okay. table, you can that, table that one. We can table the Mount Rushmore one for now so you can think about it. Um, but this is one that I, I've noticed because there's a lot of people that are in the animation field that listen to this podcast. There's a lot of people that are trying to break into the animation field that listen to this podcast. So anytime we can give some tips and advice and some tricks of the trades to the folks that are listening, I like to. Uh, so this one I've, we've been doing recently as well. It's uh, if you had a choice of two books, right? for any fan of animation or for anybody that's trying to break in the animation field, what two books would you suggest every animation fan should have on themselves? Every animation fan? Or somebody trying to break in, maybe somebody that's trying to learn the craft, the trade, what two yeah. books? Oh, well, I, I'd be, I mean, I, I, nothing is popping to mind, but it would have to, for, in, for me, it would have to be something like classical. Mm -hmm. something, and I'm talking possibly Shakespeare, possibly, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, English literature or something like that. But I mean, I could, I'm sure I could narrow it down from that. <clears throat> yeah, the two we always hear is The Illusion of Life by Frank and Ollie. And then the other one we always hear is uh, Dick Williams' uh, Animation Survival Guide. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's, those, those are certainly two very yeah. good ones. Yeah, those um, are the two we usually hear. Something, I'm just trying to think of something that really, I mean, and those were very good, mm -hmm. but I mean, you know, I, I guess I'm thinking a little wider because I'm not technically an animator. So I think in terms of design, what two books, do, what, what couple books do you usually go to whenever you're, whenever you're stuck on a problem? What are some of the books that you read? Oh, yeah. Well, I tend to go, I tend to go to the guys like the, uh, let's say that that whole realm of early 20th century illustration, mm -hmm. you know, like guys like, like Wyeth, uh, guys like Howard Pyle, guys like uh, Norman Rockwell. I mean, I'd say Rockwell's a giant for me because, because he is a, a so technically proficient. Yeah. You know, he was able to you know, paint and draw and so on. And, and he could tell those stories so well, right? Like, you know what I'm talking about, those sat all those Saturday evening post covers and he would like present something and you'd look at it and you'd kind of go, uh-huh, uh-huh, oh, I get it. Oh, I get it. You know, yeah. it'd be, oh, oh there's, there's, there's something underneath here, you know, and Rockwell will always be, I think, um, you know, one of the uh, real, uh, uh, you know, top, top, <clears throat> uh, you know, visual artists that, you know, people will, will remember. Um, and that's from that realm, you know, I mean, I also am very fond of, uh, to make it, make it a bit more contemporary, 
Peter DeSev, I think Peter DeSev is awesome. I mean, the guy, just, there's nobody better. I, I grew up more on the guys like some of those classic cartoonists. Like, yeah, you were talking comic books. I mean, I was thinking, yeah, I mean, I read a lot of comic books, but what the, 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 the art that really got me would, would be guys like Jack Davis, Ward Drucker, uh, you know, all those guys in Mad Magazine, certainly Charles Schultz. Um, yeah, I'm glad you said Charles. Uh, 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 Dennis the Menace, Hank Ketchum. I mean, those are really good and they're really well designed, you know? Mm -hmm. And Ketchum worked at Disney, right? He worked at Disney for years as, a, as an as a assistant animator. And um, yeah, there's that whole, I don't know, there's a whole bunch of it. And then you kind of get into the European artists like Heinrich Clay, Arthur Rackham, you know, again, they're kind of contemporary to, uh, you know, uh, those guys in the, early, in, in the 20th century. And then the, that whole raft of, uh, yeah, other, you know, the other Amer American illustrators, there's so many names. And that'll be the stuff that I'll kind of pull off the shelf, you know, and kind of flip through, you know, when I've got, you know, I'm kind of looking for some, you know, inspiration. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up Charles Schultz. I don't know if you can see it, uh, but uh, oh, oh I, yeah, I grew up in Peanuts for sure. Yeah, so I got a little, oh, yeah. Yeah, Great. little yeah, back. And then I've got Charlie. You can't really see it; it's upside down. But I got Charlie uh -huh. on this side. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge Charles Schultz fan, man. And I really, and, and rightly so. I mean, like again, I think he will always occupy. Uh, this place in mm -hmm. I went to call it you know in Amer well let's say American culture in in a sort of story culture you know if you want to call it that yeah 100%. and then the uh, last one we get to before we get to the fans questions this is the one this is how I got your name uh, by Tom Cito it's called the animation recommendation man so is there a friend a colleague or somebody that you've worked with that you think would have a great time on this episode or on the show that we should reach out to oh yeah yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm going to like the name that first pops into my head is a very good friend by the name of Peter Belitsky. Now, I don't know if you know him or have heard of him, but he's a fellow layout artist. We were at Disney together. And prior to that, we've known each other, uh, you know, in Toronto. He's in, he's in the animation game. Um, I should have mentioned that we, uh, well, he's been doing some teaching right now. And that's something else that I was doing. Uh, and I'm presently doing as well. So, some teaching and some online teaching. And I think that's a very important topic. We got to talk it about really that. Is. teaching. And, um, but Pete, yeah, my buddy, Peter. Yeah. Uh, I can, I can send you some particulars. Yeah. Beautiful. I appreciate that, man. So one thing I absolutely love to do is the fans questions because when the fans write in, they're a lot smarter than I am because like I said, I'm not an, I'm not an expert. So it's always interesting to see like, what the fans I'm not jump here. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, so Jeffrey Kerr wants to know, as the 40th anniversary of E.T. is upon us, what was your favorite part of getting to work on it? We didn't talk too much about E.T. in the beginning, so we're going to talk E.T. No. for sure on the second part, but give him a little tease. I'll save, I'll save the good stories for then. But okay. what was the cool part about it? It was just because, well, because ILM was riding so high in those days. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, here's the thing. Like, you don't really know much about the movie when you're working on it, right? And, like, you know, I, especially because it was just happening... Like I was working on, I guess, with Poltergeist and Star Trek, right? And E.T. was over there on, uh, it, like, you know, there was this big, you know, it's, an, it's an effects facility. So it's like divvied up into bays and there's black curtains. And then you walk past and you kind of get a glimpse of this big silver spaceship in there, you know, like with lights on it. <laughs> I mean, what the hell? And, uh, you know, or, and, or you see the little E.T. character, you know, because somebody's having to use it for, you know, some shot, right? Yeah. And um, but uh, why was why was E.T. cool in particular? Well, um, just I would say when I was working on it because of the buzz from the other guys. But then it was, you know, I, I remember going you get to go to this, you know, there's kind of this crew screening after the film's finished just before it's released. And, you know, that that really did, you know, you kind of, oh, OK, I get it now. And that really does knock your socks off. Um, but why was it like in retrospect fun? Because it was it was kind of uh, like Spielberg has, has done this, right? He's kind of gone up and down. He's had some real highs most. And E.T. was one of those highs. I mean, like it really was uh, uh, one of the, the film that, you know, kind of nailed a lot of things about 
American culture, you know, at that time, you know, and uh, so yeah, you're just you're happy to be part of it, right? And uh, it was, I'd say also, and I'll get into this if we do talk about this again, because I'd been in there for a little while and I was kind of getting into the swing of it. I kind of started to know a little bit of what I was doing, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of, you know, what my, my, my work was, my job, you know, what I had to do in terms of uh, yeah. creating the art. Um, we would like photograph our own stuff with the camera stands and the like and everything. But uh, yeah, you know, you kind of got to, you know, I was getting to get to know the, some of the other people a little better in the other departments and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, so that's why, you know, because yeah, because it was just, it was the hot, it was, it, you know, you were it, you were, you were in the place to be. You know, oh, yeah. in terms of, you know, well, uh, Hollywood, uh, certainly Hollywood effects and, and, and Hollywood movie making. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's coming after Back to the Future. That's coming after yeah. Roger Rabbit. Well, actually, yeah, that, that was before, before actually. Back that was, to the future was the year before. But I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's in the context of all, you know, the loveliness of movie making. Mm -hmm. The movies. Yeah, the romanticism of it. Which I had always, like, I've always been a lover of the movies. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so to finally, and quite by a fluke, which I didn't really get into all the details on it, but um, how I ended up finding myself there was, you know, just this lovely fluke. And, and uh, it, uh, yeah, it was great. <laughs> I can imagine, man. Uh, and I, I'm the same way when it comes to movies. That is like the equivalent of a kid going to the Walt Disney World for the first time. I bet. I love, I love everything about it from getting your ticket to going and smelling the popcorn to getting uh -huh. your drink to going and talking to the person that's going to take your ticket and then tell you where you go. And then getting to walk up and down the aisles and see the movie posters that are coming out to going and sitting and stepping in gum, just like everything about it, the tackiness on the floor because somebody spilt their soda, uh -huh. you know it's just everything about it it's just fun it's 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 a romanticized version of like what it was to be a little kid and to go out for the first time you know obviously with your parents and shit it was just something special and it's still something special for me when i get to go to the movies um and especially now getting to experience that as a father and getting to take your kids to go there see you go yeah, yeah because, it's it's, you know, it's the, something the process the process repeats itself yeah what what's cool about it is it, that will all happen whether you make it happen or not yeah you know, that's the thing it's just uh, yeah okay what's what's fun about it is even though he's getting old my oldest is getting older and he doesn't really want to hang out with mom and dad whenever i say hey you want to go to a movie for the most part he's like yeah you know, if he's trying to pick a horrible movie, I was like, come on, man, let's see something better. You got to pick the last one. Let me pick this one. So, uh, but yeah, like I said, it's always a blast to get there and, you know, hang out with the kid and then watch some movies. Um, we actually got quite a few ET questions. So if you want, we can, we can skip this one, but I would love, I would be remiss not to ask. I always mispronounce this guy's name because he's got an interesting, well, man, oh, man, welly man, Ramis. I'm not sure. So you already know who you are. Uh, he wanted to know, or she, excuse me, uh, did you do any design on ET himself or did you do just the effects? Yeah, just the effects. It was, it was a, <clears throat> well, no, ET was like, you know, yeah, it was like completely designed already. I mean, uh, there's all that talk about, there was that character, uh, the, or not character, but the man, Carlo Rambaldi, who was like the, um, he, he was, uh, he worked all around in the uh, effects industry. He ended up working, he ended up doing all the sandworms on the first Dune. Okay. Really? And uh, yeah, he was like into sort of creating mechanical things like puppets and so on, capable actuated or hand puppets. And yeah, that was a big part of effects in those days. I mean, you remember you, uh, uh, all that, I'm going to call it Muppet technology, like was really a big deal. And look at Yoda. Yeah. You know, first everybody, you know, was completely successful and it was just a, you know, Mm -hmm. just a puppet but uh so anyway but yeah no i didn't have anything to do really again as i said it was it not to get into the whole thing but it, i ended up just working on et towards the very end of my time there so i got a couple of things done and then i was gone so mm -hmm. i didn't really do enough to to get you know to be able to get a credit on it um yeah but you know i mean i just remember Again, you know, you'd see 
uh, you'd see Ralph McQuarrie walking through the hallway because he designed the spaceship, right? Yeah. And, you know, or you'd, you know, you'd kind of, again, you know, kind of walk past the place where they were maybe doing some filming on it. And um, yeah, there would be the, oh, here's one. I mean, well, I, I, E.T., I mean, I didn't do this, but I, I watched them doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a shot in E.T. where, okay, he's like been left behind and he's just been chased like all over the place. And then he kind of ends up walking into the shot and you look and you see all of LA below him. Yes. There's kind of bushes around him and you kind of see him kind of go doink, 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 doink. Okay. Flat painting of stars, flat painting of LA. And then like behind that, okay, which is flat. And then there's like these little holes or, or, or scratches in, 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 because it's painted on glass, right? And they scratch out little points on the glass. Behind that, they have uh, a roll, okay? And I think it was crumpled toilet paper or something like this. And the roll, and then a light trained on that, okay? So the roll would rotate. It was kind of actuated by a, by a step motor or something like this, mm -hmm. so it could regulate it. Okay, and then in front, you've got you know, a tabletop uh, with a hole in it and some guy with his hand up inside of the ET model and it's all lit so you know you can see ET in silhouette and then you know and then there's your camera there's your, there's your camera like looking at it right so it's all kind of a practical thing yeah and the drum rotates it makes the lights twinkle you know all that LA twinkly stuff mm -hmm. that's how it was done I mean I love that kind of thing when I saw it like the, the, the creating effects that way uh yeah I mean and then you look at it on film and it's just magical you know it's like have you gotten the chance to come to Orlando uh yes I was there a couple of times when I was working on Mulan mm -hmm. and I've been there a couple of times since just on my own um so yeah I've been to a Disney World and you know checked it all out and uh you know it's, uh, it's seen a bit of uh, I'm not quite sure I'm sure it's changed a bit did you go to Universal Studios no, I never did actually. I went to Universal up in LA, but I never went to the one in Florida. But, uh, so the one in Florida has, I don't know about the LA one, but the one in Florida still has the original ET ride. So every- yeah, I never did that, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you got to, because I never know, it's, it's funny. <laughs> and I don't know if Universal Studios, please don't sue me. Uh, so I had a friend that uh, used to work there when, Shit, when we were a little bit younger, man, it's, it's been a few years. I mean, I'm 32 now. So um, I want to say about 10 years ago, I had a buddy that used to work there. And he used to be one of the mechanics there for, for the rides and stuff. So whenever wow. something would break, uh, they would have to go and fix it. So he worked graveyard shift, which is generally the third shift before, you know, the you know, it's the late, late shift. It's the midnight to whatever shift. So in the ride, you're essentially, you're on the bicycle right you've got the milk crate in front of you oh, is that how they do it okay got yeah it. so so it's like six or nine of you or whatever it is and you guys are going through the entire movie right on the bicycle right, right. this is the most 90 shit scott you'll ever hear right this is exactly oh, the movie wow. was, right so you're riding on the bicycle and then you're you're going through specific scenes of the movie so you start out in the redwood forest and stuff and uh the cops are coming so you're hitting the cop car with your bike like they do in the movie and you're taking off and you're going to the the planet where ET's ET lived because his planet is dying. You're supposed to get him back there. So you're you're warp speeding in a bike in space somehow. It sounds so stupid, but it's such oh, a go to his planet or something. Yes, you go on. You you go uh, to his planet. I, yeah, I heard about this. Yeah. So when you, when you're doing this ride, when you walk in, because everything is the same. Uh, everything is the same exactly how you uh, how it came out in the 90s and stuff. When this ride went into Universal Studios, it's still the same. They have not changed a single thing about it, right? So it's got all of the animatronics, right? It's got the ET. It's got these characters. It's got these these cars that are still in there. These these, these it's just so cool to see it, right? So you're you're going through this ride, and when you walk in, right, you smell what the 90s smell like, right? It smells moldy. It smells old. Like it just smells, yeah. it just smells old, right? So you walk in and my buddy was like at the end of every night because there's a whole bunch of steam that goes off uh, during this and it's already humid as shit in Florida, right? So all this steam is going off. They would have to go in and spray bleach 
on the, the black mold that was building up and all that shit at the end of the night. So anytime we go to Universal, we're actually going on on uh, Monday is uh, Monday, May 23rd is mine and my wife's uh, 13 year anniversary, wedding anniversary. So we're going and we're going to go to Universal Studios. We haven't been able to go since the pandemic. We, we always had uh, we always had tickets, but just because the pandemic, nobody really wants to go and sit in lines and be that close to somebody during some crazy shit. So we're going back for the first time since the pandemic, and we're really looking forward to it. And every time we go to Universal, because I never know when it's going to come out. I never know when they're going to take this ride out, because they've already taken out Back to the Future. Oh, well, they were favorite. That was my favorite ride. I did ride the Back to the Future one at yeah. the LA Universal Studios. That was there when we got down there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah, I really enjoyed that ride. They they replaced it with the Simpsons ride, and then it's an entire Simpsons land now. And then they used to have the Jaws ride. Jaws is no longer there yeah. either, sadly. Uh, so they they have the uh, the Jurassic Park little ride, and then they have um, the ET ride. So whenever we go to these parks, I make it a point. That's generally the first ride we do because I never know when it's going to leave, and I always want to make sure that I can get on at least one last time, no matter how stupid that ride, like my son looks at me every time we go, he's like, do we have to do this ride? And I was like, yes, we do. And I promise you, once this you know, ride is you know no longer here, you have to build this thing yourself in your backyard. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, Scott, I'm gonna be real honest, man. I'm not a real man. I don't know how to build shit. That's why I cook for a living. And I talk on this, I talk on this microphone at the nighttime. I can't really build stuff. My wife can build anything, man. Her dad, her dad well, instilled in her on how to build if, shit. So if you have such a great feeling for it, you know, yeah. you can try and have a little bit of it in, in your life at home, you know. I really would, but that's why I surround myself with all of this stuff because there I get to feel like a go. kid again. You know what I mean? So, like I said, Scott, this has been a real blast. I really appreciate you taking some time with me today. When we come, when I have you back on for the second part, we're for sure. I didn't ask you some of those uh, ET questions um, because I, I, well, a couple of them. I'd love to talk about, you know, Hunchback. I'd love to talk more about Incredibles, I guess, but yeah, you know, or, you know, any of the other stuff. Yeah. beautiful man I, i'll tell you what i did this for tom because tom's coming back on for his second part next wednesday so what i'll do is i always go on the youtube channel and i put up a poll um so i'll get with you and then i'll go through a list of your of your resume and we'll pick out four i think it's five topics you can put up there so we'll put five topics and we'll let the fans choose uh from what we'll what we'll what we'll talk about and i did that with tom this this uh upcoming episode for next wednesday and it was almost like for the longest time it was unanimously shrek it was like 90 percent for like the first week on shrek alone and i was like holy shit i think we're talking about shrek anyway go ahead <laughs> yeah no yeah. no yeah, so we're 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 gonna be talking Shrek because I think it's I think it's still at like thirty or forty percent as far as what fans want to talk about. Um, so that's what we're gonna do. So we'll do that as well. I'll get whatever five you want to put up there. We'll go through your resume and then we'll fans decide and then we'll talk okay. about. I want to know uh, what was it like the was it the the people the person that I thought was no no it was the you wanted to know uh, like so what my my biggest influence was or uh, oh the mount rushmore how did, you, how did you work how did you word that the mount rushmore you had four mount people rushmore. yeah that's right. yeah. yeah you had four people plus an honorable mention so the next time you come on you got to have those four people right. i like i said i usually tell everybody that beforehand uh but i completely forgot about it oh and there is one last question i always ask this one too and by always i just started asking it about six episodes ago so i'm just going to say it's always um uh, we kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier with Sandro. Uh, if you could go back in time from Snow White to Jungle Book, oh, yeah. any of those classical animation, right? And oh. you can animate or you could do the layouts, the backgrounds of one of oh, those movies. You know, I, can, I can answer that right away. It would be Fantasia. Yeah. I hate, I mean, people go, what? But I love that film. I just think it's, yeah, if, 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 you, if you could choose, if, that was, if there was one you could go and have been able to, work on have have had worked on whatever however you term that uh yeah yeah because there was part? stuff in there yeah, what i mean it's, it's a different as i said it's a bit of a different kettle of fish it's not so much you know character driven stuff and so on and like the others are amazing too but there you go yeah that would be my choice what what part would you want to animate on well now let's see um well i'll tell you like i think right off the top of my head i would say Everybody would probably say the Sorcerer's Apprentice, of yeah. course. But uh, you know, it's the pastoral symphony that that bit where they use the Beethoven symphony and it's all the Greek uh, uh, mythology stuff. Yeah, 
somehow that gets me. I don't know what, but I, I, think, I think it's great. So one of, uh, one of my favorite scenes in any Disney movie, and we'll end it with this one. One of my favorite scenes through almost any Disney movie is in Dumbo. <clears throat> oh, yeah, sure. So Dumbo, the scene where they're giving him a bath and then they're scrubbing oh, him yeah. down and all of the stuff starts to become in little balloons or the little, I can't remember what they call it. It was an elephant parade. Or, I, I yeah, just yeah. Have... and then they get it, go into the pink elephant thing. Yes, yeah. that, like, if I had the skill the wherewithal and the knowledge to animate. Like if I was an animator, that'd be like the one scene. And like yeah, I said, Jungle Book's my favorite movie of all time, but the, but Dumbo hold, holds such a special place in my heart. So like when, uh, when we first found out we were going to have our second kid, the first thing that came into my mind was like, fuck, I want to do something with elephants because I just got done watching Dumbo. It is such a beautiful movie. I don't give a shit what anybody says about Dumbo. Dumbo is a beautiful movie. It's, 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 it's sublime. There's no other. Like there's some it stuff hits that you here. Really it hits you right here. Calm. You know, it's like not. It doesn't get its energy from. Uh, like I mean, there's some pretty dynamic sequences in it, mm -hmm. right? But its best bits are the quiet moments. It's it's yes. just, you know. Um, I was gonna say something about something about it. Well, it's just like I mean, there's that. Oh, I was gonna say you should get. Well, you'll have to get. Uh, you'll have to get. Uh, uh, I just blanked on his name. <laughs> Don't help oh, your work on that. Peter? No, not Peter. Um, oh, crap. Uh, our buddy, you know, the animal artist, you know. Uh, oh, Aaron? Three, yeah, Aaron. Thank oh. you. I'm embarrassed that I blanked on his name. And just making the joke, you know, he'd, he'd be a, a slam dunk to, you know, help you with something like that. Well, but... Uh, no, that's, I mean, that's, you know, gets into those, yeah, that gets into those moments like that are wonderful in Disney animation because they just go somewhere you just never thought they could go. You know, like there's stuff like, it, it's just so wacky and, and it's almost nightmarish, you know? I mean, I think some of the, some of the best things that Disney ever did were some of those shorts in the fifties, like say with Donald Duck, right? Mm -hmm. Or Goofy and I mean, there, there, there were specific people who I think, you know, made it, made them happen, but uh, they are really savvy. And I mean, they obviously have got it figured out. I mean, like the animation just is a given, but, and, and so, you know, they, 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 there's the gags in them are very, they're, they're sharp. I well, mean, you know, like, you know, everybody raves about the gags from Warner brothers and so on, but there's some really good gag you know thinking going on in some of those those chippendale ones you know and so on mm -hmm. yeah and it's good i mean that's i was i would just say you know for me the whole thing of going to disney it was it was a bit of a place of pilgrimage eh? because um i mean yeah my growing up was like watching disney i mean i watched uh, a lot of saturday morning tv mm -hmm. and i watched definitely you know um i don't know about you but for us it was always Saturday at five o'clock uh, was the, you know, the, the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner show yeah. hour, I think they termed it. And yeah, there was, that's when they showed all the, the Warner Brothers. Then you'd see old ones and new ones, right? And you'd always like, you could always, you know, like you really lived for the ones, which were the Chuck Jones ones and the Frizz Freeling ones were maybe not quite so funny, but you know, you know, you know what I mean? Anyway, anyway um, so they were good, but Disney, if you caught, if there was some, and in those days, TV was it. That was the only place you could go. And every now and then they run some animation on the Sunday night show, right? And uh, I just remember being entranced by that because, I mean, it was not only beautiful craft, but they, they touched you. I mean, there were emotions that, you know, that would, that, that would uh, you would feel, and you'd go, I'm, I'm laughing at this, but at the same time, you know, like if it, even if it was just Donald and the and the chipmunks, you know, you kind of feel a little bit for this guy, and then, you know, you'd sort of understand. Well, I, I'm I'm probably going into it deeper than it really was, but I'm convinced those guys were not uh, the guys who made it. They were not unconscious of that. I, I it, it, it's it was it's it just just brilliant stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's just as good as you know, right up there with Robin Williams, right up there with. Buster Keaton, you know, all those guys, yeah.
Robin Robin Williams was my favorite actor of all time. Yeah, well, he was certainly one of the, you know, one of the top ones. You know what I like? You know what I like Robin Williams in the, almost the best What's was that? Baron Munchausen. Do you remember that? I don't. Terry no. Gilliam film. Terry Gill- There's you see this is stuff we got to talk about. Um, Terry Gilliam made that film based on. Uh, it's like the, it's in the 17th century. Munchausen is this is this guy who tells tall tales mm-hmm. and. You really can't believe what he says. And then it turns out that maybe they're true after all. And uh, there's this whole thing where they go to the moon and Robin Williams is the man in the moon and his head gets away and flies around. And I mean, it's really, uh, you know, uh, what do you want to call it? Like, it's really, it's real drug stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great, you know. And, and you know, because, because Williams is just so over the top and he, he pulls it off. Anyway, anyway. But uh, sorry, that was kind of a little bit of a aside there. But um, yeah, no, definitely Robin Williams. He uh, he definitely uh, you know defined you know that era of entertainment for sure. He really did, man. And he had such a huge part of my childhood and such a special place in my heart. Um, like I said, Scott, this has been really yeah. really fun. I really Fine. can't wait really. till the part two. So I'll, we'll set something up. Um, I guess. Yeah, I got some traveling we're doing for my son's tournaments and stuff in June. So probably looking at July, August time frame. Um, but, uh, but we'll get you back on for a part two. And then, like I said, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll decide what five you want to put up there. And we'll let the fans decide. And then we'll take the top two or three. And then we'll craft, uh, we'll craft a show around the top two or three. Um, there's no other way to, uh, to really end this show. Actually, hold on. There is one way. Uh, Scott, man, if somebody wants to come by and say, hey, Scott, I really enjoyed, uh, I really enjoyed what you did, man. I really like to pick your brain here and there. Uh, are you on social media or you, you got a website or anything? I, am. I actually, it's funny. I, I got to say, I haven't even looked at Facebook in like a month. It's a good thing. <laughs> but I, uh, I look at LinkedIn. I, looked at, I, you know, I am on Facebook. Uh, so that's probably the best place. Yeah. Beautiful. If so, uh, yeah, so check, make sure you check them out and follow them. If you got a question about ET, man, post it in the comments and we'll, uh, we'll we'll talk about it the next time we come in, man. But like I said, Scott, it's been a real fun Tom. Thank you again for setting this one up. I really appreciate it, man. He's been, I've been. Thank you for, for asking this is, yeah, this is, this is definitely, uh, uh, well, you know, it's, it feels healthy. It feels good to get this stuff out, you know, like it does. It's very cathartic. I've, I've told friends all this stuff over the years, but to have a chance to actually, uh, you know, sort of say it so other people can, you know, hopefully benefit from it, you know, then that's good. That's one thing that I've definitely understood about this podcast and understand uh, when I have guests on, because I've, I've been told that I'm a lot like a psychologist here because people will come on and they'll just tell me stuff because we're just sitting here. I try to make it as fun and as inviting as an atmosphere as I possibly can, because like I said, and I tell everybody that I come on before we hit record, I'm not a professional. I'm not an expert on you. I'm not even an expert on me. There's some shit I do on a day to day basis. I'm like, I did that. I did that. Jesus Christ. What the fuck is wrong with me? Right. So there's, there's things like that. So whenever anybody comes on, man, like I said, I like to have it fun. I love hearing you guys stories. And the one thing that I absolutely, and it's not, it's not like it's a pet peeve or anything like that, but whenever somebody's like, Oh man, I'm sorry. I went off on a tangent. I'm like, no, I a hundred percent. I love when you guys go off and we get into the weeds because that's the best part of a conversation conversation you never know where it's gonna go you might have not thought about some of this stuff for the last 15 20 maybe even 30 years and then we're sitting here talking about it and when you go back and listen to this you're like oh shit that led me here to lead me here to lead me here so the next time i'm on we're going to talk about all those stars that had to align to get me back to where i was at man so that's what's so great about this medium is we never know where it's going to go but it's always fun the journey is always 90% 90% of the, uh, I don't want to say 90% of the battle because that makes it sound like it's bad, but it's 90% of the fun is just the journey and seeing where we go and how we get there. I say the fun is just getting there. Yeah. It really is, man. But he's been Scott. I've been Julian. This has been the What's My Head podcast, and this has been another piece of your childhood. Good night. Okay. My guest next week is the legendary animator, John Pomeroy. Enjoy this teaser. And another person that wrote in that you got to work with was Tom Cito. I just had Tom on again not too long ago. We went in depth. Wow. 
And uh, I don't know if you remember, because you have so many interactions on social media, but I asked you a couple weeks ago, or maybe about last week, you posted a little bit of animation with uh, John Smith from Pocahontas. And I said, where does this one rank as far as your career goes for right. Uh, accolades, right? right? So you broke it down and you gave me your top four. Um, and then that led me to going over and talking to Tom. I'm like, hey, I got John coming on this week. You got any cool stories I should bring up with him? And he's like, one comes to mind in particular. <laughs> so he was <laughs> like, <laughs> They said, okay, I worked with John on Pocahontas. He did John Smith to Glenn Keane's Poca. When we were going over the end of the song, Colors of the Wind, and I think you know where this is going, uh, what song Colors of the Wind, where they are just about to kiss, but stop before their lips touch. We kept teaching them, or he's like, we kept teasing them both. He said, I'm not sure what you mean here. Can you guys act out this scene? So he was talking about you and Glenn, trying to get you and Glenn to kiss out John Smith and Pocahontas. <laughs> oh my God. That's funny. <laughs> So, uh, like I said, I, I like sharing those little things. You got anything you'd like to say to Tom about the, him trying to bring that up? <laughs> Boy, I totally forgot about that. But you know what? It brings, it brings up several interesting ideas. First of all, for an animator to animate something that has authenticity, Julia, it's important that they become that which they are creating on paper. Yeah. So... Glenn had to be Pocahontas. Whatever the feminine side is that he could muster up, he had to be the Native American princess. He had to be a woman. He had to be athletic. He had to be gorgeous. He had to be all the things that he was putting onto paper and to make it convincing. I likewise had to do my research about John Smith. You know, I found out all kinds of information. I've read his diaries. And so I had to fill myself up with the John Smith experience and become him mm -hmm. in order to be authentic with the animation I was creating. Otherwise it would look robotic and generic and you wouldn't have cared. 